get my screens in order. Bear with me just one sec here. Zoom management. Yeah, I'm trying to... For some reason, I can't seem to get my attendees list into a different window. Um, okay. <clears throat> just taking a quick look at the attendees. Make sure we've got... Uh, let's see, there's Commissioner Five. Can someone promote Commissioner Five, please? Um. Okay. All right, I think we're ready to go, Chair. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Washington County Coordinating Committee meeting for Monday, October 17th, 2022. We're here on Zoom. Uh, do we have, I think we have a visitor comment, Stephen, is uh, what we saw. We, we do. Uh, Mr. Robinson, were you interested in providing uh, a public comment to the committee? Yes, please. Thank you all. My name is Dave Robinson. I'm a resident of Rivermead in Washington County. Uh, Mr. Roberts, I want to thank you for your email response last week. I would ask you to take a second look. I have submitted a uh, reply to your email seeking general information on how the public can become more involved with Washington County regarding the urban growth boundary at Beef Bend and Roy Rogers. And uh, the reason for my call in this morning is to introduce myself and ask also, uh, is there a definition of the process and the deadline for public testimony submitted to Washington County land use and transportation? Primarily, I'm looking at Kingston Terrace by King City and River Terrace 2.0 South by Tigard. What, what would those deadlines look like for public input? Um, I, if it's okay, I think we should probably take this call offline. This is um, really just an opportunity if you wanted to provide some feedback, rel maybe relative to that issue, to the coordinating committee. This would be oh. an opportunity to do that, and then I'm happy to follow up with you. We're actually working on a response to your latest email so okay yeah just comments i think that the committee for king city are doing a fantastic job in their planning but there is overwhelming objection to the east west connectors and so i just want to make sure that, that the feeling that the residents have is that they're being ignored by king city uh, and i just want to make sure that everybody is being heard and that the people like myself who have grave concerns um, have some input on the outcome and that we're heard by Washington County because we don't believe we are to date. And that's all I have, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. And um, just as a quick heads up, the, the meetings are recorded and posted online. Um, and I don't believe we have a representative from the city of King City who was able to join us today, but um, we can share your input uh, with uh, the city's representative as well. Thank you. And oh, and I see uh, Councillor Rosenthal looks like needs to be promoted to a panelist, please. So we can do that. Okay, uh, and then I'll just very quickly, if there was anyone else uh, who might be in the attendees that was interested in providing a public comment, this would be your opportunity if you want to raise your hand. All right, Chair, I'm not seeing any other raised hands. Okay, well, that's visitor comments. Um, do we need to do any introductions uh, for roll call today? I, I think it looks like our uh, usual cast with a couple of uh, not abnormal substitutions. So yep. Yeah, so um, if it's okay, I will just run through the roll call real quickly. Sure, go ahead. Great. So I'll call an order of jurisdiction again. So for uh, City of Banks, I see we have Mayor Jones. Here. Thank you. For City of Beaverton, Mayor Beatty is with us, I believe. Yep. Here, and uh, I'm going to have to switch to my phone about halfway through the meeting, so there's no chat function today. Okay. All right. And then we'll uh, try to keep an eye for you and the attendees when you rejoin. Thank you for that heads up. Uh, City of Cornelius, uh, Mayor Delane. Present. Thank you. Uh, City of Durham, do we have Mayor Sherado? So, okay. Forest Grove, I saw Mayor Truax. Yo. Welcome, thank you. 
Uh, let's see, City of Hillsboro, Mayor Callaway, I saw you here. Good afternoon. Uh, for City of King City, I don't believe we'll have a representative who's able to join us today. Um, North I believe Mayor Sherrado just joined. Oh, ah, thank you, Mayor Sherrado, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, and I saw Mayor Linehan is here for City of North Plains. Present. Thank you. City of Sherwood, we have Councilor Rosner, or Council President Rosner, thank you. I'm here. Uh, City of Tigard, Mayor Snyder. Here. Thank you. City of Tualatin, Mayor Bubenick. Mayor Bubenick, okay. We'll keep an eye out for him. And for Wilsonville, we have uh, Council President Ackerval joining us today. Here. Thank you. And for Washington County, Commissioner Fye. I'm here, Stephen. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, and uh, let's see, Councilor Rosenthal, I see you're here representing Metro. Thank you. Uh, do we have Matt from ODOT, Matt Freetag? Uh, yep, I'm here. Hello. There you are. Thank you. And I don't believe we have a port rep today. And do we have uh, Tara from TriMet with us? She said she'd be a little bit late, but she will be coming. Okay, we'll keep an eye out for her as well. Okay, that concludes the roll call. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I take some consideration of the minutes for September 12th. Are there any adjustments that need to be made? Having read them religiously, I move for the approval of the minutes. Motion by Mayor Truax. Do we have a second? Second. Second by uh, uh, Tim. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Sounds like it's all uh, it's there. Okay. Uh, that takes us on to MSTIP 2328 update, refined project cost estimates. Um, Aaron, I think you're going to be sharing the update with us on these, aren't you, for MSTIP? That's what I'm here for. Awesome. Aaron, I'll let you take it over. Great. And we have some slides, as Yay. always. Chuck has those to bring up, or Teresa. Thank you so much, Teresa. Here we go. So my name is Aaron Wardell. I'm the Interim Planning and Development Services Manager for Washington County. I'm also normally the Principal Transportation Planner. So we are here to give you your monthly update on the MISDIP 2328 funding allocation. This week we will be, or this month, we'll be doing a review of our community engagement and providing a little bit more information after our briefing last month. And then we'll be talking about the refined cost estimates. Next slide, please. So some of the additional information we're bringing forward regarding our survey are in your packet, you received a report that has some additional data, including the number of responses by zip code and the detailed comments that we received as a part of that survey. There was a lot of interest in what we heard from the community, so we're happy to share that. We will be reviewing the refined project cost estimates and asking for your feedback about that and then reviewing our next step. Next slide, please. So we talked about this last month, but as a quick review, through July and August, we had an online open house as well as in-person community engagement opportunities around MISTIP. We went to 15 in-person events. As a part of the survey tool that we used, we asked participants to pick up to three projects per commissioner district that they would like to see prioritized for funding. When we asked that question, we shared it without project cost estimates, and we did not ask the community to consider any trade-offs, just which of the projects were the ones they would like to see prioritized. We talked about this again, as I said last month, but we were really pleased with the tremendous response we received to this survey. This is a really difficult point in time to do community surveys. People are receiving surveys um, from a variety of different public and private sources every time they log into the internet. And so getting any kind of a response rate these days is really difficult. And we got 721 responses to our online survey. So considering that it was a pretty challenging survey, it required quite a bit of reading in order to get through it. We thought this was a really tremendous response rate. And then through our in-person community events, we were able to get another 254 paper responses. So we had almost 1,000 community members weigh in on this, and that makes it really successful. Next slide. 
So this is an example of one of the new pieces of information that was provided to you in your packet today. You can see that we had pretty good response coverage from around the county. This is by our zip code boundaries. Zip code boundaries are really weird. They don't follow any other jurisdictional boundary that most of us are familiar with, but it gives you an idea of how those responses were spread out pretty well around the county, and we did have people from outside of Washington County. And I think that's because some of these community events we were participating in really had a big draw area, but these are people who may not live in Washington County, but they certainly travel here and they come to our community events and they are interested in ways to get around the county. So we're really happy to see this kind of a spread in our response geography. Next slide. So again, this is in your report if you'd like to read more of the details, but what we heard from the community in broad terms is that without considering trade-offs or project costs, there really was a lot of support for all of these individual projects. At a high level, people told us that they want sidewalks and bike lanes. They want there to be less traffic congestion so they can get to where they need to go in a reasonable amount of time. People would like access to transit so that they can take advantage of the transit service that we have available and people would like to see lighting and safety improvement across the board. Now, when we asked people about these projects, there were a variety of different opinions about how to fix whatever the problem was. So there was broad consensus that there are a lot of problems and that people want these projects built, but we did hear some different opinions about how to approach them. So specifically roundabouts, when we're out there doing community engagement, that's one of the um, specific project types that we tend to hear a lot of feedback about. People tend to either really love roundabouts or they really don't like roundabouts. And so we heard some specific feedback about that, but there was certainly agreement that all of these projects should be done in some fashion. Next slide. So the community input is one of the important components for consideration in how we will develop the final funding recommendation for the board. And so this slide shows these various components that could be a part of that. In addition to community input, we'll be considering these refined cost estimates. We'll be talking about those in the next few slides. We'll also be considering the risk assessment for the projects, whether or not the projects were previously funded, meaning are they already in the pipeline for construction dollars, and what was their equity index score when we ran our equity analysis. Next slide. So the refined cost estimates and risk assessment was a new step for the 2023-28 funding allocation process. This is not something that we had done in previous allocations. And one of the lessons learned from our 3D and E funding allocations were that project costs escalated quite a bit beyond what we had expected that they would. When the projects are proposed for funding, oftentimes they're coming out of transportation system plan or other planning efforts. So they're planning level cost estimates and those can be very different from how much a project is likely to cost when it's actually being designed and being built. So we wanted to have an opportunity to do this extra level of analysis so that our projects were all uh, went through the same cost estimate screening tool and that we knew that we were comparing apples to apples as much as possible when we're looking at how much these projects are going to cost. We know we're still probably not quite right because we're going to find something unexpected when these projects do move into their final design and their construction, that always happens, but we're hoping that we're closer and that this gives us a better idea of the true cost of these projects. Some of the factors that are included in these cost estimates are the cost of construction materials, the stormwater management that'll be required, the right-of-way costs, street lighting, utilities, and then the cost for construction project management. The consultant we hired also did a construction risk assessment for each of the projects, and they were assigned either low, medium, or high based on the consultant's technical um, opinion about how challenging these projects were going to be in order to deliver. And some of that relates back to these factors such as stormwater management and how challenging some of those things may be. Uh, Councillor Rosner, I saw your hand just went up. Yeah, just a quick question on that risk. Is that a risk to, to budget? Uh, could you yes. just explain a little bit exactly what that means? It is a budget risk. So if there's a project, for example, that has uh, two culverts and a bridge, we're going to assume that's a pretty high risk project because we know that there's going to be some water management challenges in delivering that project. If there's a project that looks like it will require extensive right-of-way acquisition, that's another thing that would be considered high risk, um, just for a couple of examples. Thank you. Next slide. So this table was prepared for each of the four districts and the projects within those districts. And so what this table is showing you is the 
basic information we have, so the project name and if it's proposed for design or for final design and construction, or if it's proposed as a match to some other kind of external funding source. We're then showing you the equity index score as a reminder of how these projects scored in that analysis. They're ranking in the survey tools that we used. And remember, even within those survey rankings, that all of these projects had a significant amount of community support. Whether or not the project has been previously funded through design, generally these are projects that were funded through the last cycle of MISTIP for design so that they'd be in line for construction in this allocation. And then we're sharing these new pieces of information we received from our consultant, which is the draft construction risk assessment. And it's draft because we still may make some adjustments to this as we're reviewing the information that we received. And then our proposed MISTIP funding allocation. I do want to note for the projects that were proposed for preliminary design or for match, you may not see a construction risk assessment or a change in the project um, cost allocation because our consultants didn't run those. The projects that are funded possibly are proposed for design. We're just assuming a placeholder amount for design. We didn't need to run the construction risk on those. And then for the match projects, we are just trusting that whatever the match amount would be would match up with another funding source. And so those weren't run through the screening. So that's why there's some NAs in these tables. I'm not going to go through each of the numbers specifically, but I think the takeaway from this is that generally these projects are really expensive with a couple of exceptions. When we ran them through, they went up in cost because again, we were using planning level cost estimates. So I think that we found this to be a really productive exercise and we're really happy that we had the opportunity to have a consultant work with us on this. We still have them under contract and we're still working through a couple of details on a couple of these projects. Um, one of the projects in particular, the 170th Avenue project, we may have our consultants look at phasing that project because it is such a high dollar um, commitment in order to build that, but it's an important project, and so we might want to think about breaking that into phases and what that could look like. So we'll be looking at some of these others and seeing if there's some opportunity for that as well. So I'll pause here on District 1 and see if there are any questions that come forward. Not seeing any, Erin. Okay, let's go on to District 2. Ooh, this is not displaying correctly. It looks like the table somehow was stretched on the slides. That's some, uh, that's some column width you got there on that proposed for. Yeah, I don't know how this happened. Can we go to the next one? Ooh. And there it continues. Something went wrong with our PowerPoint. Looks like you got deaf by PDF. I know. Teresa, do you want to stop sharing and I can share because it looks fine on my screen? Okay. We will change this on the fly and see if this works. I'm going to share my slides. Okay, is that displaying? Yeah, that looks great. Great, okay. See, nice, we just see information. Nice technology <laughs> swap there. Nice, very nicely done, folks. We're all cross trained at Washington County. We can share PowerPoint to the drop of a hat. <laughs> okay, I'll keep all that you get going on it. Great. So, any questions on District 2? Yeah, looks like we got one. Yeah. Thank you. And actually, this probably applies to all the slides, but um, could you clarify um, the survey ranking column? Is that what rose in popularity on the online and paper surveys or? Yes, exactly. So, yep. So, we totaled the number of times a project was selected for prioritization by a respondent. And again, they could pick up to three for each commissioner district okay. and then rank them in order. And within each district, even our lowest um, projects in terms of how many times they were selected were selected over 100 times. So all of these projects okay. had quite a bit of support, um, but some had more support than others. So we're showing that here. Okay. And again, the risk um, assessment column was back to 
what you said initially before we started looking at the tables, um, that there's risk in the cost fluctuation? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yes. Okay. So the risk affects um, how close we think we are on the cost estimate. And if the risk assessment is high, that means that we think there could be uh, more room for basically cost escalation. We, we don't think the cost would generally go down, um, but if there's a high risk, it's because something's happening here that we think could make this an even more expensive project. So, for example, on this slide, the Saltzman Road project is the first one, and you can see it has a high risk assessment. The reason is that that requires a bridge structure. And anytime you're working with a bridge structure and crossing water, there's a lot of variables in there that could make a project more expensive. And the cost of steel is always going to be a huge factor in there as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. Let's move on to District 3. Oh, now I'm sharing, so I can do that myself. Oh, there we go. Mayor Snyder? Well, I just, when, when you're ready for, I mean, are you ready for questions and comments on District 3? I didn't want to. Yes. Yep, let's go for it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just some thoughts on Greenberg Road and some feedback from myself and our teams um, about this work. I mean, we appreciate the detailed work that's been done. Um, and I guess my comments are going to be about Greenberg Road, but I actually think that they should be being thought of more broadly by um, by others about the projects that are on these lists, all of them because of the methodology here. Um, our under, just a little bit of background, Tiger's done quite a bit of work pre this process on Greenberg Road and had cost estimates because we were thinking the projects would be delivered in the next five to seven years of, you know, $21.5 million. Uh, I think the Sid, the South Cities in District 3 provided sort of a uh, summary to the county and to Commissioner Rogers about what we wanted to see in the South Cities and had uh, Greenberg Road at $20 million. And I think the message here is that this cost estimate of $18.7 million, if it was being designed and constructed like this year or next year, maybe that's right. Um, but there's things at play here from a cost construction standpoint that make us very concerned about that number because, you know, the county's wanting to engage in a jurisdictional transfer conversation. And our past experience has been that if, you know, if there's a expected cost overrun, then either the scope of the project gets uh, decreased, which would be a problem for if the county really wants a jurisdictional transfer on Greenberg Road. Um, or we've got to come up with the money, which we don't have, um, or just less stuff gets built, like whatever. It, it's going to be a problem. And I, I don't think we understand the why we would move. It, it's certainly to get the project done on the timeline you're expecting, it's going to cost more than 18.7 million. So we don't really understand why we would not just have it um, planned at the $20 million mark. And I think my comments about the construction cost uh, increases and in unpredictability should be, everybody should be thinking about those proposed amounts given the uh, methodology that Kittleson used. Thank you for that comment. Um, I'm writing down a note and we can look a little bit more closely at the Greenberg Road cost estimates. My understanding is that because Tigard had recently done that concept plan that it came in really close to what the consultant also estimated, which is great. Um, we were happy to see that. We did assume a 30% contingency for each of these projects as well, assuming that if cost escalations are about 5% a year, plus some other unknown factors, that 30% gives us um, quite a bit of room for costs to escalate over time. But we can look more specifically at Greenberg Road and make sure that we have a pretty solid cost estimate going into the allocation recommendations. The Tiger team would like to see that contingency on this project at 60% and not at 30 with what we know and what we expect. I'll, I'll be quiet now, but thank you for listening. Okay. And it, I think it's something for us to talk about too. Uh, one of the pieces of 
the MISTIP funding allocation is reviewing our administrative procedures for how we manage these projects. And one factor in there is how we handle cost overruns over time. So we expect, yeah, projects do run over cost quite frequently for a variety of different reasons. And when that happens, how are we going to pay for it? So in a case like this, um, with that specific project, if we have reason to expect that we should be allocating more because we've identified something else and it does need to be allocated at 21, um, then that's something to talk about and where could that additional three come from? Is it part of the MISTIP allocation or does it come from TDT or does it come from another funding source? So making these pieces work is really challenging. Councillor Rosenthal, I think your hand was up next. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just a couple of technical questions. One on on 306, Tuol and Sherwood Boone's Ferry intersection, is the construction risk high because of the presence of the railroad, or is it just assumed that the uh, the the um, west line is going to remain as is? And then the other question is the Boone's Ferry Road 308. Is that from downtown to Allerton to Wilsonville? Which uh, which segment is that? So to your first question regarding Tualatin Sherwood Road, Boone's Ferry Road intersection, the risk is high for that project because of the presence of the rail line and because there would be some significant right-of-way um, acquisition required. And those are operating businesses right now, like the McDonald's that's right there at the intersection. And so those factors make this a high-risk project for us to go forward with. Okay. Um, and then as far as the scope of the Boone's Ferry Road project or the extent of that project, I believe this was primarily the Wilsonville segment of Boone's Ferry Road, although we could do some design work for the Tualatin segment of Boone's Ferry Road as well. Oh, I think you might be muted. Yeah, let me just follow up. So that would include from the, uh, the, the, the potential intersection uh, with uh, the uh, Basalt Creek Parkway? In the future Basalt Creek Parkway extension, yes, south to the I-5 ramp. Okay, thank you. Councilor Rosner? Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I'm looking at some of the numbers here and how's they, how they've changed. Um, in the case of Sherwood and Edie Road, you know, we've done some preliminary work ourselves. It would We would like to see the, uh, I'd like to have staff look at the, the detail that came out of your consultant's work so we can compare and contrast and, and make some, some appropriate res, um, recommendations. And, and I'm assuming uh, the other, uh, mayors in district three probably are going to have a similar request. I saw some head nod heads nodding out there. So we, we just like to go through that and, and look at that because you know we have some safety issues out on that road. We just want to make sure we're getting a good chance at it. Anyways, that's all I had. Thank you. Great. And we're happy to follow up with anyone's staff if you give us a call um, or have them give us a call. We've already shared out the detailed cost estimates with the members of the coordinating committee's tax. So they have all of that information. I would ask that staff who are probably listening right now not follow up directly with our consultants. We need to go through county staff in order to do that. And so we're happy to answer those questions and then engage our consultant as we need to to get some more technical information. As I said, we still have them under contract. So if we have some cleanup work to do, we can do that. Next slide, move on to district four. I keep forgetting that I'm presenting now so I can do that myself. Here we go, district four. Just pause here for a moment, see if we have any questions on District 4. And again, you can always reach out after the meeting if you have any questions. Okay, so with that, let's talk about our next steps. So there was a piece on an earlier slide that I didn't mention then, which was, we are available to come and talk to city councils again, or Metro Council or any of our other advisory boards if people would like another briefing we would be able to come and talk about what we've learned through this process, through our community engagement. We can talk about the cost estimates and we can talk about um, some of our comprehensive transportation needs and funding opportunities, which is some information county staff are putting together for our board right now. So if that is something that you're interested, please reach out or have your staff reach out. We would like to get any council briefing scheduled ideally before the end of the, the year um, or in January at the very latest. So we'd like to get working on getting those scheduled um, as I said, we are working on reviewing our comprehensive transportation needs and funding, and we'll be sharing that information with our board. That will then inform our MISTIP project prioritization discussion. 
we know from all of this work that we have more needs than we have funding for. And so we're going to have to be creative and we're going to have to keep working on finding ways to fund all of these projects because they're all very much needed. And then in early 2023, we will be requesting board approval of our 23-28 funding allocation package. And our next slide is our funding allocation timeline. So you can see we are here and we still have quite a bit of work to do before we get into the beginning of next year and reach our fourth milestone, which is adoption of the package. And then I think my only other slide is contact information. There we go. Okay, so a couple other hands go up. So uh, Mayor Jones. So I've been browsing through all of the uh, survey comments and it seemed like there are a couple themes that keep popping out. One of which was, well, I'm not in this area. I know nothing about it, but I was forced to choose one. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like there should be an option that's like an, a no opinion option the next time something like this happens. We understand that. And we did see that comment come through. For the next time we do this kind of a survey and online open house, we could consider not having people rank projects in all four districts. Our concern was that if we allowed people to access the survey before they did all four districts, that we would have um, people who didn't do all of the research or people trying to vote multiple times without you know, considering projects in all four districts. So that was why we approached it that way, but we did hear that feedback. And so I think it is something we should think about going into the future. For the paper survey, when people filled them out on site, they didn't have to do that. They could just do whatever they wanted on the paper and hand it back to us. So it's sort of a challenge of doing online surveys. Um, again, that's why we were so happy to get so many responses to that online survey, because it was a challenge to fill that out. And it was a challenge to learn about all four districts. But um, 721 people took us up on that opportunity. So we were really happy with that response rate. Okay, thank you. Mayor Turek. Yeah, um, I see the schedule of where you hold, held the surveys and the events that you were at when you were conducting the surveys. And the only one in the Grove was the farmer's market on the 17th of August, which was canceled because it was a horribly hot day. Um, and nothing was rescheduled, I guess the 17th or the middle of August was when you were running up against a, a time frame on that. Um, but I, I guess I'm a little bit concerned that there was um, no event with the, the next closest one is at the Cornelius National Night Out or the um, farmer's market in July, and then in the 1st of August was the, the national night out. Again, um, I didn't see a lot in, I didn't see any other events in Forest Grove or in the west side of the county, so. We were sorry about that with the heat incident. So we were under a bit of a time crunch. We needed to do our engagement in the months of July and August in order to get this information back. Um, the heat events took us by surprise. We actually had three or four events that were initially canceled and then had to be rescheduled. Unfortunately, with Forest Grove, we didn't have an option to reschedule. I don't know why, but there wasn't an available spot at the next week's farmer's market, and so we weren't able to get that. Um, so I do apologize for that. We were able to do 15 events. We were happy with that number. Um, it was a lot of staff a lot of staff work to put that together, but we were really happy to get out there and be able to engage with the community and collect 254 surveys from the community and talk to way more than that um, in terms of the number of people we were able to engage with. So in the future, I think lessons learned if you're doing engagement in Oregon in July and August, expect that heat is going to be a factor. And so you might need to consider backup dates in advance. Um, I think that would have been something good for us to do so that we would have had a second Forest Grove Farmer's Market on the schedule. I believe that we did do another Forest Grove um, event. It was just after our MISTIP engagement window had closed. And so we talked about the Council Creek Regional Trail and our transit survey opportunities instead. Thank you. Mayor Linehan. Thank you um, for the presentation. I appreciate that. I was also kind of curious. I know that that you um, had a uh, rather large active audience at the Garlic Festival, and you had um, 83 responses, which is amazing. 
Um, in, in, did you surmise that most of those, were they locals or were they, uh, you know, I was just kind of curious, um, the, maybe the zip code range or, or just your thoughts on, were they Washington County folks or were they kind of, you know, folks from Portland and beyond? You know, I think that Garlic Fest has a really big draw. I have to say there, there were definitely North Plains folks who I talked to at that event, but I talked to people who were coming from all over the place because they were excited about that particular event. Um, we also had time at the county fair and we talked to people from all over and we were at the county fair, even though it's in Hillsboro, people come from all over to go to that event. Um, and then I want to say that Tualatin, Viva Tualatin event also seemed to have a pretty big draw. I talked to people from all over the place who had come in for that event. So, you know, I think some of the night markets and some of the farmers markets really were more of a local audience, like people who would normally come and shop at that particular event tend to be closer into the community. Um, but the Garlic Fest, the fair, and that Viva Tualatin event really did seem to have a pretty broad attendance. Councilor yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to echo what Mayor Truax said about Sherwood. Um, you know, we were disappointed that we're, there wasn't any events in Sherwood mm -hmm. um, that made the survey. I and mean, we did get 50 responses out of the zip code, but that zip code covers a lot beyond just Sherwood. So really don't have a good feel for how many people in Sherwood are able to engage. And I, I would also suggest going forward um, for the next round uh, that one, you know, make every attempt to make sure we have one of these events in each of our communities. But secondly, there, there's a lot of tools out there with Facebook and different social media platforms to boost and, and get these uh, surveys into people's in front of them on their screen so they can have a chance to take them. So. Yeah, and we did that with the online survey. So we did use Twitter and Facebook, and we really appreciate our city partners who helped us amplify our engagement efforts through their websites because a number of the cities did help us to support getting that link out there to as many people as possible. Um, we also distributed the postcard flyers to the library system. And so even if we didn't have an in-person event in your community, your library most likely had the cards to give out to people. And we asked for city staff to support us as much as possible in some of these community opportunities if we weren't able to get a booth at a farmer's market or something like that. And we really appreciate the support we got from city staff in making those events happen as well. Did, did you do a paid um, advertising on Facebook or any social media platform or are you just relying on organic distribution? I don't believe we did paid advertisements. I think we were relying on our usual Facebook channel. Yeah, I, that's that's what I was suggesting in the future mm -hmm. to make sure it's you get a good distribution out there. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you. Good feedback. Thank you. Uh, I think Mayor Beatty is next. I'm not hearing. Mayor Beatty, are you still muted? She may not have had her hand up. I was just trying to get back in the meeting on my phone. Thanks. Oh, there you are. Great. Well, sounds like we ex exhaust all the questions, Aaron. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for coming out to uh, National Night Out in Cornelius. Thank you. Okay, that takes us over to the TriMet Forward Together concept information. Uh, like, welcome back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Tom Mills from TriMet will share TriMet's service concept. This was also will be uh, for those that uh, frequent JPAC, you'll have the opportunity to see this again. And this also will give an opportunity for us to share comments with our JPAC reps, uh, Commissioner Fai and uh, Steve, to you know let them know when they're in that discussion. Tom, you ready? Maybe, maybe not. Stephen, do we have uh, Jeff, I think it's uh, Ms. O'Brien. Is it? Is it that is is involved in this? Uh, I, I think Tom's presenting. I just, I, Tom, are you? Uh, I think you unmuted now, right? Bueller. Bueller. Yeah. Apologies, Tom. If you're trying to speak, we can't hear you. Ms. O'Brien, are you prepared to pitch hit here? 
No, it's really Tom's presentation. I know he's called in. I see him on the panel. Um, and Teresa, you could get the slides ready. Yeah, can you get can you get the slides queued up, Teresa? Um, do you want to maybe switch back to your computer <laughs> if you can hear us if you're in a conference room and it's not working? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. now we can. we can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. I, I thought I had called in. I was listening through my phone the entire time, but then as soon as I got promoted, I lost it somehow. Uh, so I apologize for all that. And uh, Tara, now I'm going to ask you to advance the slides for me. Uh, I think, so thank you uh, for that. Tom, I think Teresa has them. Yep. Oh, it's Teresa. Okay. Yeah, so she's, uh, she's got them. But but she'll have to go camera. fast. I know there's a lot in here. <laughs> okay, I'll go fast. Uh, and again, I apologize if for whatever reason the camera's not working either. So in any case, thank you for having me today. My name is Tom Mills. Uh, I, I recognize many of you from many years of coming to this committee, though it's been a while. Uh, I am the director of uh, planning and policy at TriMet. Uh, and let's go ahead and talk a little bit about Forward Together. I know some of you have heard about this already. Forward Together is TriMet's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, a lot of things have changed since COVID-19. There have been changes in, in demand and goals and expectations, as well as uh, the resources available for us, uh, us to operate the bus. Oops, uh, there we go. If we can get the next slide, please. There we go. Uh, so let's start with talking about changes in demand. Uh, I want to point to the uh, graph on the right because it really shows, it really illustrates what has happened to our demand. Overall, actually, our, our system-wide, our demand is down, uh, as of last week, 38%, which is actually a huge improvement from where we were uh, a year ago and certainly two years ago. Um, but still, we have a long ways to go. But what's interesting is that the demand, the drop in demand has not been evenly distributed. And what you see in this uh, graph on the right is the first three lines starting from the left going to the right, starting with line 76, you see that ridership has only dropped by 2%, uh, which is, is great. Uh, and that's a, that's a line there in Washington County. A couple other lines you see the drop hasn't been terribly significant. But then when you get to, uh, you start looking at some other lines, you see some big drops. You see on the 94, uh, a drop of 58%, the 99, 68%, the 61, 72%. Now you start to ask yourself, well, why is that? And uh, what's interesting about those three lines that saw such large drops in uh, ridership is they were uh, express oriented buses to downtown Portland. So they're there very much so focused on getting people to work in the morning and getting them home in the afternoon to and from downtown Portland. So we can go to the next slide. Also, uh, we've been surveying our riders. Uh, we surveyed over 5,500 riders and uh, really asked them, well, you know, how should we be restoring service? What are our priorities post pandemic? And, you know, usual kind of things, you know, uh, ridership, uh, growth of trans in uh, traffic congestion, but also really uh, an interest in making sure that we're serving uh, people with lower income. Uh, so those are kind of the three major uh, things that we've heard from, uh, from our uh, constituents, our riders. Next slide. And then our resources have changed. You know, actually, in the past, of course, you've probably all heard me say, you know, that we'd love to do more, but we only have so much money. Uh, and that, of course, is always an issue. But this time around, uh, money is not the primary uh, limiting factor for us. Uh, we are experiencing a labor shortage. We're turning it around. Things are getting better. So we, we see a light at the end of the tunnel in about a year and a half to two years. Um, but um, we're definitely in the midst of this labor shortage, just like you know, the school districts are with their school bus drivers, et cetera. I'm sure you've all heard about that as well. And I know that some of you uh, also, um, you know, are aware of the, the reductions we made in September of this year. Two lines in Washington County did go, go away. They were discontinued. Those are lines 50 and 92. And that was related to uh, decisions we had to make 
uh, to address our labor shortage and uh, you know, look at the ridership on some of those lines and whether people were still using them or not. Next uh, slide, please. So we're gonna uh, go through our rec the, the concept and uh, you know, what it says. What I want to stress is this is not even yet a proposal. This is a conversation that we wanna have with you uh, and let us know what you think. Did we go too far? Did we, didn't, did we not go far enough? Um, and you know, give us a sense of what, uh, you know, where your priorities are. Uh, next slide, please. So real quickly, I want to go through uh, a way of thinking about transit that we really haven't thought about much before, uh, and it, it really helps to uh, understand how we have designed uh, this service concept. So when you think about transit and, and the way one lives, uh, you know, here's a person uh, in the middle of it. If we can go to the next slide, here's that same person in the middle of a city, and, and all around that person are all these opportunities. You can see the bank is within walking distance, there's a grocery store, there's a cafe, the school, the gym, maybe the, the, her uh, place of work, and the next slide. But really, that person can only go so far uh, before she just won't travel any further. And that distance really winds up being the wall around her life. Uh, next slide, please. So all these things that are within that wall uh, are really what, what she can do. Uh, those are all the opportunities that she has access to. So the trick here is to expand that wall to more opportunities. And remember, it isn't just geographic expansion. It's also in terms of time. Uh, how far can she travel within a certain amount of time? That is reasonable. In, in this case, she's saying 45 minutes. So if we take that concept and we apply it to, whoop, yep, next slide, please. If we apply it to the TriMet transit system, uh, what we want to do here is increase the access that somebody can travel within a certain period of time. That way, they, they are more likely to use the system. So here's an example. Based on the service concept, the forward together service concept, uh, this is an example in East Portland. Uh, the person is starting at 148th and Halsey, and the pink area represents where that person can uh, travel within 45 minutes today as the system is, not just in terms of where the, the buses and, and trains go, but also in terms of the schedule, how much we, we also kind of factor in some walk time. Uh, and so how long it, it would take to get to one place to another. Uh, and then you see with the blue, that rep, oh, nope, go ahead back to the, there we go. With the blue area, you can see that with forward together service concept, that uh, access, that, that wall around that person's life has now expand, expanded uh, incredibly. And where can that person get to now? Well, that person can now get to jobs in the Columbia corridor, or maybe that person works at Amazon in Troutdale. That person can access that. Maybe that person's family is further south, uh, you know, down toward Lentz or Pleasant Valley, et cetera. And when we look at the, uh, the, what we've done with Forward Together, and we apply this analysis kind of across the, the region, the median number of jobs reachable uh, within the service area by residents within 45 minutes increases by over 45%. Uh, and I'm just gonna read these factors here. And over 80% of the service area residents would see some improvement in access to jobs. Uh, and so then there's other kind of important destinations like grocery stores and things like that that increase uh, as well. For example, here, uh, more than four grocery stores reachable in 45 minutes by the median resident. If you could go to the next slide, please. So when we look at that from an equity standpoint, 35% uh, uh, of median jobs are reachable by a person living in an er any of TriMet's equity areas. So it's TriMet... Uh, TriMet uses uh, several factors to determine uh, whether an area is equity. We look at 10 different factors that range from uh, uh, income, race, age, disability, youth, et cetera. Um, and uh, people who live in those areas, now their access to reach median, the median number of jobs reachable uh, in those areas increases by 35%. 
Furthermore, more than 50% of residents of the equity area, areas outside of the, oh, excuse me, more than 50% of the for residents of equity areas outside the central city, so places like Washington County, increases by 50%. Uh, and 50,000 more lower income residents and 33,000 more people of color would be near a frequent service line than today. Remember, frequent service are bus lines that operate every 15 minutes or better uh, all day, every day. Uh, the next slide, please. So what is in the service concept? And I'm going to get to the map here in a minute. Uh, but real quickly, uh, an expanded frequent network, so like I said, those lines that run every 15 minutes, uh, extending the grid to new areas. And this is something you're really going to see uh, in Washington County, Washington County, particularly in the Beaverton Hills, Hillsborough area. Uh, more local services running every 30 minutes or more. Uh, and expanded, and then expanded weekend service. So if we're really trying to cater to kind of essential workers, uh, people who, who have low wage jobs, uh, those folks don't work necessarily weekdays only nine to five. Uh, they're working on the weekends, they're starting their day maybe at 10 o'clock and they're working until eight o'clock at night, et cetera. Uh, new lines serving areas that are far from transit today. But of course, with all of this comes trade offs uh, reduce service to some low demand and mostly high income areas. And the reason that there are trade-offs here is because this is a financially constrained, uh, service concept. Uh, whereas before we had the service enhancement plans, and I know I spoke to many of you about those, those were unfinancially constrained. Those were, Hey, how do we want to grow the system in the future? And then we'll find the money to do it. Uh, and you know, we were fortunate enough to have the HB 2017 pass uh, with this funding. And that's been great. But this is really more focused on reallocating service uh, away from areas that are unproductive today. Maybe they were productive prior to the pandemic, but they're unproductive today. And allocating them to areas where we think they will be productive uh, in the future. Ultimately, what this service concept does is increase the service uh, above today's levels uh, by 38%. Now, of course, today's levels are lower than they were prior to the pandemic. If you compare to prior to the pandemic, it's about 10 to 12% more than what we had prior to the pandemic, because we do expect a, some growth. Many of these ideas come from the service enhancement plan that we talked about. Some are brand new though, and they come from really looking at the existing conditions uh, post pandemic. Next slide, please. So let's jump into this here real quick. So, uh, the first uh, recommendation is to increase the frequent service network. Uh, and here in Washington County, you can see, uh, well, first of all, this is a map of the frequent service network today, plus those lines that are highlighted in yellow that we are recommending are uh, increased to frequent service. Again, lines that run every 15 minutes or better. So you can need, see more frequent service on Cornell Road, uh, more frequent service on Farmington and 185th, and more frequent service on Beaverton Hillsdale Highway. Now, you'll see that doesn't go all the way into downtown. The reason for that is today, uh, between Shoals Ferry and downtown, we, we tend to consider that frequent service because the Line 54, which operates on DH Highway, combines with the Line 56, which goes on Shoals and connects to DH Highway. So from Shoals to downtown, between the two of them, they're running every 15 minutes. But now we're saying we want the whole 54 line all the way from Beaverton uh, into downtown to be running every 15 minutes or better. Next slide. And, ex and next is extending the grid, uh, especially extending the grid for frequent service. So, uh, you know, here, this is really the most efficient way for transit to work is when you're trying to get the, from point A to point B. Uh, and you take a frequent service line, uh, you do have to transfer, but if the transfer is something that comes very frequently, well, then the transfer isn't very burdensome and you can still get to that location uh, in an efficient manner. Next slide, please. Uh, enhancing standard service. So uh, there's some service that is at a much lower frequency today than it was at the, prior to the pandemic. Maybe there's some service that was at a lower frequency uh, uh, even before the pandemic that we think we can really get more rides out of. Uh, and so uh, we're saying let's increase those frequencies uh, on those existing corridors. Next slide, please. And service to new areas. 
and we're going to look at a map here in a second, but and you'll get to see that. Um, but across the, the whole uh, service concept, 500,000 more residents would be within a quarter mile of uh, walk to a bus stop, and 26,000 more jobs would be within a quarter mile walk to a bus stop. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, uh, improved service on weekends. Uh, you know, most definitely, if you're a retail worker, you are working on the weekends. Uh, and so uh, we, in the past, you know, the thinking had kind of been, our, our priority had been, you know, dealing with the peaks, which were uh, the Monday through Friday rush hour. Uh, well, that's not as strong as it used to be. Uh, so maybe we can reallocate those uh, service hours to other parts of the week, other parts of the day, uh, and weekends certainly should receive more uh, more service. So under this concept, 100,000 more people uh, are near service on Sunday, and 130,000 more people are near frequent service on Sunday. And we, and I would say in the last few years, we've really kind of tried to make our Saturday service and Sunday service the same. Um, so uh, there's really not. So if it says Sunday here, it also means Saturday. Next slide. But as I mentioned, there are trade-offs to make this happen. Uh, there would be some service reduction. And, now, and this is just saying service reductions. In some cases, there are also lines that get moved from one location to another location. Um, on this list, there aren't a lot that are uh, Washington County focused. Uh, line 55 goes to Beaverton Transit. Uh, actually, no, I don't think it quite goes all the way to Beaverton Transit Center. Uh, and line 61 does come from Beaverton Transit Center, 64 from uh, Tiger Transit Center. But we have some other solutions for those as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here's the map that I've been promising you the whole time. So this is our existing transit map today. Uh, you can see some lines have a green label. Those are frequent service lines. So those are line 20, uh, line 76, and line 57. And, and I want to let me point out, this is not all of Washington County. This is just, uh, I will get to the, the southwest part of Washington County in a second. Um, uh, so then, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And this is what the service concept uh, recommends. So. Again, where you see the yellow highlighting, uh, that would be an upgrade to frequent service. Uh, where you see the blue highlighting, that is uh, service on uh, roads that don't currently have service. Uh, and then where you see the red, the pink highlighting, those are areas where we would be discontinuing service. And I have to say the, the area up in the showing Cedar Mill, Saltzman, Thompson area, and the Leahy Road areas. That line was the line 50 that discontinued in uh, the fall. Um, so I just want to highlight uh, some, some new service here. Uh, 170th uh, on uh, line 67 there, that would be brand new. Today that line, one, that line 67 only goes from Rock Creek, TCC Rock Creek to the Merlot Road Max Station. So that would uh, extend it down 170th where we don't have any transit service. Um, and it would um, uh, go to Allen Road and to the Beaverton Transit Center. Uh, I want to also highlight two new lines that would serve the South Hillsboro community uh, going north-south uh, and connecting with, the, um, with Max and then uh, going all the way up to uh, well, one line going up above Highway 26 to the employment area another line going up to uh, the employment area where the Amazon facility is. And I want to also highlight areas where uh, there's reduced service. So Laidlaw Road in uh, the Bethany area, uh, that is an area we currently serve and we just don't really get a whole lot of rides from it. And then uh, the uh, North Hillsboro area, the Jackson School Road area, um, obviously there is uh, an ant excuse me, not an Amazon, Intel uh, Jones Farm, uh, and the Brookwood, Dawson Creek uh, business area, including the Brookwood Library. Now, we've already talked to uh, a lot of staff about that. There is concern about uh, the Brookwood Library and how we can serve it. So uh, definitely, uh, we're going to be taking another look at this and uh, seeing how we can serve some of these. Uh, also, I want to point out 
that uh, those blue areas up in the north employment area, uh, there is a shuttle that runs there. Um, maybe it's possible to shift that shuttle over to uh, serve the Brookwood Library uh, and Jones Farm, et cetera. Next slide, please. So when we apply that analysis uh, that we uh, that I showed earlier uh, to this area, and again, we're just putting, you know, you have to, to choose a point. So we're kind of choosing a, a point in the middle there uh, for uh, Evergreen Parkway and Amber Glen. Um, here's what you get. So that pink area shows where you could go to now within 45 minutes. The blue area shows all the new places you could go to within 45 minutes. But also notice there's a couple orange places. Now, orange could mean one of two things. It could mean that there is no more service there, so you can't go there. Or it means, well, there's service there. It's just going to take you a little bit longer than 45 minutes. And that's what happened. So actually, both of those are occurring. So if you recall, I mentioned the Laidlaw line going away. That's why you see the orange area in Bethany. Um, but the orange on Main Street is not because there's no service on Main Street. It's because we, instead of having that service turn north and go up to Intel, uh, Ron Lur Acres, and then on up to Bethany, we have that service continue uh, east-west on uh, baseline uh, all the way to the Willow Creek Park, uh, excuse me, Willow Creek Max station. So that means you have to make a transfer, which means it takes a little bit longer than 45 minutes to get there. Next slide, please. Now here's the southwest part, and, and I promise you we're just going to go through the slides here in Washington County. We won't go through the rest of the region, um, but uh, so it'll give you time to talk. Uh, here is the southwest area today, and uh, again, you see the green labels for the frequent service lines. And the next slide, please. And here's what we recommend in the future. So, and you can see a little bit from the area before. So uh, this is, uh, shows new service to Progress Ridge and the Mountainside High School uh, Mountain Park area, uh, as well as uh, new service on Walnut uh, that would go all the way to the Tiger Transit Center. Uh, we do move the Line 76 frequent service line um, off of Hall and over to 72nd. Um, this was an idea that uh, actually staff at City of Tiger had because of all the, the development and density that is occurring there. Uh, one thing I do want to highlight, uh, we're showing Line 78 on Benito Road today. That goes to uh, PCC Sylvania. It would not under this scenario. Now, we've heard a lot of concern about that. So that's something we're going to be taking another look at. Um, certainly, we want to serve Benita. We want to serve Cruise Way uh, every day. But we also recognize the importance of connecting Washington County to PCC Sylvania. Uh, I do want to point out uh, one of the express lines in Powhatan uh, that uh, goes on I-5 uh, would no longer go on I-5. Uh, uh, what happens is that line is shown here at line 44 uh, going up Boone Ferry Road. And it would, uh, it, it would actually continue on Boone Ferry Road through Lake Grove and Lake Oswego. And that would go to PCC. Uh, Sylvania, and you can continue on into downtown Portland. Uh, many of those pink areas that you see are actually in city of Portland and Lake Oswego. And I think now if we, I think the next slide, oh yes, I want to talk about uh, OHSU. So today uh, there's regular service from uh, the east side of Portland to OHSU, frequent service, every 15 minutes. But there's only some employer, or excuse me, uh, rush hour uh, express lines from the west side and southwest. And what we are suggesting is that we create uh, two new lines, or we take two new lines, and we have them run up to Market Hill all day from the, the west side. So we get rid of uh, those express lines, and we replace them with lines that would run all day uh, to the hill, benefiting both uh, employees as well as uh, patients. Next uh, slide, please. And here we go. We'll uh, run this analysis here again. And uh, you can see the pink area uh, is what you can access today. 
and you see some new access with the blue areas uh, as a result. Again, there's also a little bit of orange. Uh, again, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't get there, it just takes longer. And next slide. Okay, so if we could just zip to the bottom, actually, I think it's the second to last slide. Just do it up, up, go, okay, third to last slide, next one, there we go. In summary, whoop, nope, there we go, perfect, thank you. In summary, uh, you know, I won't read all these stats, but you can see uh, this SERS concept really uh, increases people's opportunity uh, to reach jobs, uh, to, you know, uh, have service near their homes, uh, as well as uh, frequent service and uh, service on the weekend. Next slide. So uh, again, this is not a proposal, it's just a draft con concept. We wanna hear from you. We're gonna continue our engagement uh, and, uh, and refine the, the, uh, what we've heard based on what we hear. And then we'll be bringing this back to uh, our board. Uh, we do hope that the first changes will occur in September of next year. Um, and we will be doing uh, additional outreach uh, for that initial tranche of, uh, of service changes. Lastly, I do want to mention uh, that there is a uh, public meeting uh, on Thursday at uh, Shoot Park uh, uh, Library in, um, uh, in Hillsboro, and uh, that begins at 6 p.m. And um, there are also two virtual uh, public hearings or public uh, meetings one in Spanish and the other in English, and that all that information can be found at trimet.org slash forward. With that, I will take questions. I might just chime in with one more item before we dig in quickly. Thanks so much for the presentation, Tom. Um, I just wanted to add, since I think we've been getting this, this question at every presentation in terms of implementation timeline, um, I believe we're looking at a three to five year implementation timeline for the full implementation of, of this plan. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we would love to do it all in one, you know, once we come up with something that we can all agree, we'd love to do it all in one fell swoop. But some of this is related to growth. Uh, and of course, all of this is gonna be contingent on recovering from our labor shortage, which again, we are turning the corner on. So we think, you know, come next September, September we'll be able to start restoring uh, the service, um, but we'll only be able to do a little bit at a time. Great. Okay. And then I do know there are some proposals related to shuttles in um, other areas that correspond with um, this service concept proposal. So um, there we, you will hear more about that <laughs> soon, but um, I'll turn it over to the WCCC members for all your questions. Just wanted to make sure we got that in there. Thanks. Frank, looks like you hit the, the call button first. All right, thanks. So Tara and Tom, so am I right in looking at the bus, this new bus line 44 going down Boone's Ferry is going to replace the 96 Express bus to the city of Portland? That, yes, yes, that's correct. And the, the rationale behind that is again, uh, you know, with people working from home now, the demand for that service uh, is, is, has really softened significantly. Um, especially, you know, uh, an express line, line that travels on the freeway, while that is really wonderful for the people who can use it, uh, we can't stop and pick people up on the freeway. So you really need to pick up a lot of people in Tualatin in order to make that a worthwhile service. And with so many people working from home now and not traveling into downtown Portland, it really, those resources could be used uh, better, we believe. And we think the better option is to provide service for you all day uh, on Boone's Ferry Road, connecting with Lake Grove and PCC. No, I, I appreciate that. Cause yeah, cause we know the development that's going down on Boone's Ferry Road is gonna be hundreds of houses and now a proposed 200 unit apartment complex. So I'm very much appreciative of having seven day a week service on Boone's Ferry 
And so uh, Tara just alluded to the 76 would be going down Borland Road. So that would eventually replace the Rye Connection shuttle heading towards Lake Sweet, not uh, Lake Sweet, right? Heading towards Oregon City. A great point. And I, I yeah, I, I can't believe I, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> so yeah, that's something uh, new. So the Line 76 uh, today uh, goes to Meridian Park Hospital. Oh. And what we are proposing is that it continues east on Borland, gets on I-205, and goes to Oregon City. That would happen seven days a week, um, all day, seven days a week. Um, so uh, yes, we are proposing that. And of course, as a result, uh, those shuttle resources could potentially be redirected somewhere else right. uh, where, yeah. So, and one of the things we like to think about is, is these shuttles, they, they kind of serve two purposes. One, they prime the market for us uh, to, you know, kind of come in and take over. Uh, but two, there may be areas where the market isn't strong enough for TriMet, but yet the shuttle can, can be there to be that uh, option for those who uh, are interested in riding trains. Right. No, these, these, Two lines look good to me. Thank you very much. I'll, that's it for me. Thank you. Hey, before Tim jumps in, we've got uh, eight minutes and nine people with questions. So we're going to have to snap them up a little quicker. Thanks, guys. Tim, you're up. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, a lot of good information. I, maybe just a couple of comments. Um, when you talked about your surveys at the beginning and serving your riders, I, I would posit that, um, just take Sherwood, for example, there's a lot of people I know in Sherwood that would take the bus if it went to the work centers that they work in. Um, and so I, I think as you look at how to improve ridership, I, I highly encourage you to do some surveys outside of your ridership um, and what the potentials look like for that. Because, you know, Sherwood, play, Sherwood pays a lot and try and taxes and not a lot of service down in our area. And I'm not complaining about the service we have. It's great. And there are some people that use it, but most of our, uh, we have 9,000 people that leave Sherwood to work and, and most of them are going to areas that aren't within that 45 minute time frame. Um, and then on the, the talked a little bit about equity. I would also encourage you to look at where those people work, not just where they live. I think that's an important aspect of, of the analysis that happen, happens. We have a lot of people that come into our community to work um, in lower income jobs. Um, and right now they have to have a car to get here for the most part. And that makes it difficult for our employers. So it's a, there's an economics development side to this as well, as you guys know, but I, those are just two things I wanted to point out. Thank you. Thanks. And I would just note, note we definitely, we definitely are not only doing surveys of our riders, we've done public outreach beyond just our own ridership. And um, as Tom said, right now, we're seeking feedback on this plan or not plan, network concept <laughs> through the 31st. So um, lots of in-person opportunities to weigh in as well as online. <laughs> Mayor Truex. Thank you again. Thank you, Tom, for the information. I guess my suggestion, and this is all it is, is on your third slide, you talk about the changes in demand uh, between 2019 and uh, 2022 and the changes in the goals. I would almost Washington countize those, countyize those, those numbers. Um, I see Hall and Greenberg and I see Pacific Highway in Sherwood, but one of the most important lines in Washington County is the 57 line. And I think if you speak to a Washington County group uh, in the future, you might want to include where that is because that's probably one of the most important lines, not only uh, in, in Washington County, but also across TriMet. And then I would think you would might on the next slide, the changes in goals indicate where, um, what would be some of the examples uh, of improvement in service in Washington County on those, those particular areas, um, giving us examples more of Washington County than across the, the system. Um, I was a little disturbed 
at the time we spent on 148th and Halsey um, because I can't recall the last time I've been to 148th and Halsey. I realize that sounds rather parochial on my part, but um, if you could localize these present this presentation to hit home for the person uh, in in that particular neck of the woods, uh, probably be a little bit more effective. But thank you for uh, for the information I did get. Thank you, Mayor Kelly. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Tom and Tara. Appreciate. Uh, the work that you and all of your staff have put into this. Um, you know, obviously concerned about losing um, you know, bus service to uh, the library along Brookwood, um, but also concerned about losing uh, bus service to Glencoe High School. I think that would make it one of the few high schools in the, um, in the region that doesn't have TriMet access or service. Um, a couple of questions. One is, or, or maybe just observations or comments. One is with the three to five year implementation, I worry or I would like to know that cuts won't be made prior to the new service um, you know, being implemented. Because if a cut is made you know, in year three of you know, the implementation, but isn't uh, the, the new service isn't put in place until year five, then you have a two year gap theoretically where there's, you know, where there's a, a real drop off in service. So I would just wanna make sure that the, you know, the cuts and the, the starting of new lines or, or new service frequency would be um, very, very tight. Um, secondly, one thing which, he has not been mentioned, but I think really has to be addressed. And that is, um, you know, the impact on senior and disabled service, because I believe that some of the criteria for those uh, service uh, for lift and whatnot is, you know, it's uh, proximity to existing TriMet service. And this could have a, a throughout the county, just a pretty big impact on the ability of handicapped and elderly writers to have access. Um, so those are the two comments. Then a question the, uh, with the, the, the North Hillsboro uh, employment area, will that also, I guess, reflect um, you know, the 24 hour, seven day a week shift schedules uh, so that whether it's Monday through Friday and also weekend, there will still be um, you know, that, that same kind of coverage to accommodate the 24 hour a day, seven day a week shifts. Thank you. So uh, yeah, uh, thank you for all that. Um, with re real, real quickly, with regards to services, ADA paratransit service for seniors and people with disability, um, you're right. The TriMet lift service boundary is based on proximity to the lines. It's within three, you have to be within three quarters of a mile of an existing transit line. Um, in the past, and so we are looking at that and what those impacts will be. In the past with service reductions, what we have done is we've said anyone who has used uh, our Lyft service within a year of prior to the reduction would be grandfathered in. And so anyone after that uh, would not be, but of course they would be locating there uh, in knowing that that service is not available. That's one way to address it. But we're also looking at other possibilities, and we'll be reviewing that with uh, our executives. Yeah. Uh, and then, oh, and then, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I lost, lost. Oh, the 24 hour. So um, I, I can't promise you that it's going to be 24 hour service. Uh, but what I can promise you is that we will try to hit, uh, have the schedules hit all the biggest shifts, shift changes possible. Um, it just wouldn't be efficient for us to run service 24 hours uh, to make sure we're hitting all the shifts, but we will try to, our best to hit uh, as many of the big shifts, big shift changes as we can. Thanks. And, you know, with the grandfathering, I appreciate that. Um, but I think it's, um, you know, for folks who move into an area then that know that this is, um, you know, I'm trying to think exactly how you framed it, uh, but those who move into an area would do so knowing that they didn't have access to to lift. Um, 
but that I guess assumes, and it's and it's a wrong assumption um, that folks have a choice. Uh, you know, because some of our elderly, some of our um, handicapped individuals don't have a lot of choice as to where they can live, and so um, you know, grandfathering some and then not allowing others, I, I think, really does a disservice uh, to those um, who frankly, are on the margins. And I think that this has an, the, the ultimate impact of marginalizing them even more. Thank you. Thank you. I will just say in regard to your first question, Mayor Calloway, um, in terms of implementation timeline and not wanting to remove service before additional service is added, that's absolutely something we'll be looking at in the next phase once we start making some additional tweaks, because we do still need to do a Title VI analysis for any cuts and changes. Kristen. Thank you. And thank you so much for the presentation. Um, you know, I guess in the spirit or theme of Forward Together, um, I, I also saw that you mentioned that this is the start of a conversation in the slides. But I'm hopeful that you can detail how TriMet um, plans to engage and perhaps most importantly, coordinate planning with the other transit agencies um, and TMAs. Um, as I certainly hope that this will happen in the future. Um, if you have information to share with us now, or if you will be reaching out to SMART um, and some of the other transit agencies that are doing work to serve you know, all, all of our populations. And yes, and thank you for, for raising that issue. So uh, I know Chris Steffenbach knows this well. I am trying to, um, point person on the SIP program. And as a result, I meet with Dwight Brashear and uh, the other Clackamas County uh, Transit uh, executives uh, on a monthly basis. And uh, we do a lot of coordinating in that regard, especially when it comes to uh, what we refer to as the regional coordination funding. Uh, we provide SMART uh, some of our SIP funds to actually operate service into the TriMet area from Wilsonville, and uh, I believe we're actually going to be increasing that uh, in the next uh, round. So, uh, yeah, we'll keep uh, coordinating with uh, Dwight and the smart folks. In fact, uh, Dwight and I spoke uh, just the other week uh, at the WCCC TAC meeting about this. About this plan specifically, the concept plan? Yes, yes, and specifically line 96. Okay. Which is the I line that goes to Wilsonville. Okay, I think that coordination is is really important that that they all feel included in in the the work that we're putting together. So thank you. You're welcome, Mayor Schneider. Yeah, just very briefly, since we don't have a lot of extra time, um, I want to point out that the uh, Tiger Transportation Advisory Committee, which spent hours evaluating this, and is frankly our best community resource and thought leaders on transportation put a, some very thoughtful feedback together. And I would just ask you all uh, on the TriMet side to look at that communication very closely um, and pay attention to it. There's concerns about uh, broken connections and access, for example, to PCC. I'm not going to get into all the details, but I would really implore you to look at the detail that they spent hours putting together feedback with. Yes, thank you. We did receive that letter, and I and uh, I have uh, looked at it, and and yeah, we mentioned the same things about PCC, uh, and they also invited us to come and uh, speak with them. So we're going to try to follow up on that. Mayor Beatty, uh, thank you, Chair. I do, uh, you know, I'm I'm glad that we're getting more frequent connections on both of our abandoned state highways eight and ten. However, we also have a max line and Highway 26 that runs the entire gamut of what the service line is. The majority of my residents live north and south of the max line. And the biggest uh, impediment to using transportation is the fact we don't have more frequent services into the southern part of our community. Um, and that, while I don't represent Bethany, um, and I know uh, Councillor Gonzalez is in the participatory function of this call, I know that more of our communities would use it with a stronger connection north and south. So while I really 
appreciate more frequent services east and west, I want us to put some thought into where our community lives because an east and west connection connects Hillsborough to Portland. Beaverton residents are not able to use transportation at its highest quality because of this lack of, um, you know, we do have service along Murray, but again, it's very hard to go when it doesn't go into our neighborhood. So I think for us to be able to consider TriMet as a good partner, more frequent north and south uh, connections would be in our community's best interest. Thank you for that. And uh, I, I agree. And, uh, you, you know, this, I, I will point out uh, bus line 88, which is uh, serves your community uh, south of Beaverton Transit Center. Uh, I didn't highlight it, but uh, we are recommending the fr frequency on that increase to operating every 20 minutes. Uh, from right now, I think it's every half hour. Uh, and then um, uh, bus line 52 is recommended to become frequent service, and that serves uh, Farmington uh, and then goes north-south on uh, 185th. But I, I certainly hear you. Uh, there's a, a, a much larger South uh, Beaverton area as well. And to follow protocol, I raise my hand. Um, I'll start with what I, you guys have all made a lot of great comments. All the rest of my peers, I appreciate that. Um, I, I think I just have to throw a little more light on the lift surface. Um, I think it's arbitrary and it's capricious. It should be expanded to cover at least everywhere that we consider a uh, municipal area around here. Cause it's just the people who need that the most are the least able to be served because they end up getting pushed to the margins. And I know from personal example with my mom who lives in, lived in a, a nice trailer park on the north side of Forest Grove where we didn't know all the rules when we moved her out there, found out after the fact that she was a quarter mile past the limit, yet it's called Main Street in Forest Grove, runs the in, you know the length of the town basically north south, but there uh, there's no lift service, there's no bus service, and I would chime in with uh, Mayor Callahan, uh, Mayor, Mayor Callaway, that um, also Forest Grove High School is not serviced by the TriMet system. It kind of turns around fairly short of that. Um, I kind of came to this presentation with no dog in the fight because we get one line in and out. But then I looked at Hillsboro and asked, I have to ask if Mayor Callaway's, um, I thought South Hillsboro was a lot bigger than that because it kind of looks like the bus just comes into South Hillsboro, turns around and leaves. I'm not sure if you have another system that you're hoping to use or why it doesn't go through your community because it's, it seemed significantly short-sighted to me that it would only come into the neighborhood, turn around and leave. It's kind of like the way it comes into Forest Grove, turns around and leaves again too. So yeah, Pete, I thought you might get a thumbs up on that one. Um, so I, I'm gonna color it the way I'm seeing it. I see this as an evolutionary change, not a revolutionary change. And what we need to get more riders on this system is a revolutionary change. And I think you need to reach out and figure out how you're gonna get tens of thousands of more people on the system to make it functional and financially what it should be. We've got 74 buses running up and down the 57 every day. That should be carrying 20%, 25% of the capacity of TV highway and it's carrying single digits. So I think, I think we're, we're missing the entire customer opportunity. So I'm hoping that there's another, like a part two to this that talks about how we get, and uh, Tim really hit on it. How do you get from work to home? Right, we have a huge employment center in North Hillsboro. Uh, very little service there. Same with Tigard and Tualatin. And you can't get from Hillsboro to Tigard and Tualatin in less than two to three hours. So I think we're totally missing the bus on some of this stuff to be quite pithy about it. So appreciate the presentation. I can see some ideas, but I think we really need to go further, a lot further on this to really take advantage of our opportunity here. Thank you. And we are uh, so far mention, over time. Tom, Tom, you got some okay. feedback? Great, I appreciate it. The last thing I'll say is there is a, a round two. Uh, Good. Uh, probably in a year from now, we'll be kicking off round two, which is the unfinancially constrained uh, version of this. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's move on, because we've eaten huh, about 10 minutes of the Metro Urban Growth Boundary Exchange update. 
So um, I think Ted's going to talk about that. Ted, aren't you? Great. And I think uh, Andy I'm, I'm and joined Andy by, by Andy Shaw, uh, who's going to start off. But thank you, Mayor. Yeah, and this is really talking about that Metro Officer's uh, recommendation. I don't think this needs a lot of introduction. I think a lot of us know what's going on here. So do you, you want to jump in and get us rolling? Well, so we do have, we have some slides, and maybe Great. we can skip through them kind of quickly. So uh, thanks for having us. I'll just jump right in as we get this ready. Andy Shaw, I am the Interim Director of Planning, Development, and Research at Metro. Um, Tiger, the City of Tigard brought to us late last year a proposal for a UGB expansion. And in considering that proposal and how to uh, respond to it last winter, our COO made a recommendation to our council to look at a, a UGB swap or exchange of land um, instead of using the mid-cycle authority that we all worked to get a while back through the legislative process. So let's go to the next slide. Um, just want to ground this. Our current urban growth management work is really based in the idea of readiness, going to places for expansions um, that have done the planning, have identified how to fund infrastructure, um, have had discussions in their communities about growth and how to accommodate growth, um, and, and really are, are bringing forward solid plans that match with the, the, the growth uh, goals of our region. Um, next slide. We've learned a ton, and we've had these discussions with many of you at, at various tables in the, in the last couple decades about urban growth management. Uh, learning from those mistakes, we're trying to bring forward new tools, and this urban growth land exchange represents one of those tools. Among other tools, the establishment of urban rural reserves, so we have a sense of where we're growing and what we're, where we're not planning to grow, uh, and, and the, um, the ability to move onto farmland with those urban reserves, because we've identified urban reserves and protected other areas. Uh, the mid-cycle process, and then, of course, the, the strong focus on looking to cities to do planning ahead of proposing urban growth boundary expansions. Um, next slide. So that brings us to Tiger. This circle shows the area uh, under consideration. Uh, the city of Tiger has proposed uh, a 500-acre expansion. 350 of those acres are what we call buildable acres. Um, it, we'll slip, skip to the next slide as well. Um, so, and I know the mayor's on here, could probably talk to this more eloquently than I, but uh, it's 500 acres uh, divided across two areas uh, of out in Tiger River, Ter River Terrace West and River Terrace South. It's the second phase of overall River Terrace area. Uh, it, we were impressed that it provides a, a variety of different housing choices um, in, in all residential zones. We're looking at about 20 dwelling units per acre in the development. Uh, in a, a range of production of housing from 3,000 to 4,500 um, units. So also very impressive. Um, three community parks, six neighborhood parks, and six linear parks planned to provide recreational areas along with the housing and commercial nodes in the area. So with that, uh, we'll speed over to Ted, who's gonna take through us the next couple slides, the consideration of the exchange process. Thank you, Andy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as Andy mentioned, our council asked that we put together an exchange process for their consideration. Um, so we set about trying to identify essentially areas that are in the urban growth boundary that have not demonstrated their readiness to, to develop housing uh, uh, over the years. And so we started that exercise with some mapping, uh, essentially looking inside the urban growth boundary within a mile buffer. Uh, for unincorporated areas that had significant amounts of, of buildable land uh, remaining. Um, and of those areas we initially identified through the mapping, we then went about um, consulting with um, staff at the local level, cities, counties, service providers, to get a better understanding of the, the planning and development status of, of those areas. Um, and so the... the um, options that we came up with initially, of course, needed more refinement because there were too many of them. Um, so we consulted with uh, IMPAC, Council, IMTAC about uh, some considerations we might use to narrow those down further, uh, which leads us, I think, on our next slide, uh, please. Uh, yes, there, there they are, the considerations that we um, used to narrow things down further. So things like that, that planning infrastructure and development status that was really the, the the substance of our consultations with local jurisdictions. Uh, how long have these areas been in the urban growth boundary? Um, were they added to the urban growth boundary for a special purpose that that uh, probably deserves more discussion rather than pulling those areas out of the UGB uh, in this process? 
Um, and so the, the recommendations now that, that our chief operating officer has, has released, um, uh, be we believe those best meet these considerations. Next slide, please. Uh, there are three of them uh, because our council asked that we give them some options rather than just uh, one proposal. And so each of these options um, would give the, the Metro Council um, the ability to add the Tigard River Terrace 2.0 area to the urban growth boundary and take out a comparable amount of buildable land elsewhere. So we're looking for about 350 buildable acres. So that's after you account for envi environmental constraints like steep slopes, um, riparian areas. Uh, this first option uh, is in out in uh, um, Clackamas County. Uh, so you see the black line there, that's the urban growth boundary. Um, and you see the, the locator map down the left-hand corner. Um, so right north of Highway 212, uh, and then the um, western border of this option is uh, East 242nd Avenue. So about 350 buildable acres there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this one is just uh, north of the area that you just saw in option one. Um, so again, uh, east, uh, or yes, east of 242nd Avenue um, out in Clackamas County, um, 366 buildable acres here. And our third and final option uh, for the council's consideration um, includes some of that area that you just saw in, in option two, um, slightly reduced because this option also includes an area called Park Place just outside of Oregon City. Um, and we get to about 352 buildable acres with, with this option that spread out across two different locations. Uh, and I think from there, Andy has a final slide. Yeah, so we can advance. Yeah, thank you. Um, the process from here, uh, we, we've gone through the course of this year having uh, the analysis, the conversations with uh, local governments, local service providers. We've gotten out to some neighborhood associations. Uh, some city councils, county commissions, uh, gone through the process of narrowing. We now have the COO recommendation and we're in, entering into a public comment period. Uh, we have two uh, stops before MPAC and a couple more stops for a council uh, trying to continue talking about, are these the right considerations? Are these, these, these look like good options to consider asking our council in December to further narrow from these three options down to one or some consolidated set uh, and then uh, propose action early in the new year in January uh, to consider this uh, UGB exchange. So that's the process going forward. And I think with that, we can finish this, the slideshow and uh, we'd love to hear any questions you have or any discussion or feedback. I'm gonna open up by saying thank you for your speed reading. I felt like I was reading about a prescription drug there. Thank you, Andy and uh, Tim, nice job, Ted, nice job. Uh, Mayor Schneider. Well, I just want to thank the staff and frankly Metro for putting such thoughtful uh, plans together about how best to move uh, Tigard's uh, application forward in this space and work and appreciate all the Metro Council's thoughts and uh, Councilor Rosenthal's support through the process and um, you know I'm certainly here to answer any questions about the Tigard component of this. I think we're less uh, concerned about exactly what choice is made and, and more interested in making sure that land that is ready to be built and used is um, moved forward and that places and spaces that really are unlikely or just have no path to uh, urbanization anytime soon um, should not be uh, kept in the UGB wall um, space that is ready to go now is not. So thank you for hearing me out. Other questions, comments? I find it interesting. Yeah, I mean, most of us have had the experience of working through the challenges of developing land or adding things and, um, you know, mine all the way to the state house. <laughs> Most of us on the west side had that opportunity in 2014. Um, so, you know, I, th I think the, the questions or comments that I have is, is um, willing partners, right? I, I know the success we've had with our South Cornelius 
is willing partners. And I've also had the surprise of the Northeast Cornelius area of people that had interested, but probably weren't saying a lot to their neighbors about how they wanted to actually, you know, develop their land given an opportunity. That's kind of the things we've seen, but it's, it's all about a, do you have the services, right? I mean, that's what I'd be looking at Jason about. Can, can it be serviced what you want to add? Can it, you know, are, and are the participants willing? And I don't think we ever get to hundred percent willingness. There's always some holdouts that are, you know, I never ever want to be in the city when they bought a place, you know, a long time ago. But I, th I think we have to understand that part of it too, right? So that that's progressing in a good, reasonable and planned direction is very important. So Jason, do you think you guys are, you got willing partners down there? You, you're, you got something that people want to do? Absolutely. I mean, that, this has actually been a little more of a grassroots effort than maybe these typically start with. And um, both uh, developers that have options on properties and have plans. I mean, it, this is part of the urban reserve and was clearly going to be developed um, at some point in the in the future and is immediately adjacent to the first parts of our river terrace uh, development. So yes, I would say you force me to say yes or no, we have willing partners. I would say yes. Of course, nothing's 100% as we you just mentioned. So what about the on the metro end is, are the participants looking at the uh, exits, willing partners to get out of this program? So it's, it's been a very interesting discussion. Um, and, and I think a good a good chance to talk with with many of you, your staffs, about uh, you know various areas around the region and challenges that, that they have. Uh, Ted and I were able to go talk to the Oregon City Council, for example, and had a really you know practical discussion. Uh, each of the city councilors and the mayor understood the areas that we had looked at from a technical exercise, had been out there, had heard from residents about the challenges of getting services out there and the costs and. Uh, those are areas that were added, Ted, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the 2002 cycle. Um, so we're 20 years in and they've not been developed. And the city council essentially said, we, you know, we were interested in being a regional partner and seeing um, housing, advancing the production of housing. And if Tiger can do that and these areas can't, then we're willing to participate. Um, we, we were out with the Damascus Community Planning Organization and that was about 30 or 40 residents out in the Damascus area and except for one person, they all asked, please take me out of the urban growth boundary because uh, they were sort of in your, your uh, scenario, Mayor Dillon, of saying we moved out here because we didn't want to be near lots of growth and lots of activity. Um, and so we'd prefer to be that much farther away from the, a time in which our area gets developed. Um, we've had more of a challenging conversation with Clackamas County, uh, who I think is concerned about something being taken away and um, you know a sense of they, they'd like to see some forward movement in, in some areas, and this maybe feels like uh, going the other direction. Um, I think, you know, good to note, taking an area out of the urban growth boundary doesn't mean it's off the table for future consideration for development, if that makes sense in the future. If a city brings forward plans and it's it's proximate to a city, could be, uh, uh, infrastructure could be uh, brought out to it, et cetera. Um, we're, we're looking at questions like, does it become an urban reserve? Uh, or is it undesignated? What does that do in terms of its sort of line in, in um, the, the process of consideration? Um, so, you know, the, this process, going through this process now has been really fruitful to examine a lot of these issues and, you know, potentially make this a tool for us to come back to in, in future growth discussions with what we've learned here. I will just uh, also note, um, we have a 2040 development grant cycle coming up. So we are poised to uh, announce the process for what will be a, a $1 million uh, you know, new areas planning fund. That's two times the amount that we've offered in the past. Uh, and that will be followed up early next year by additional 2040 planning grants that are the, the other side of, of the coin or you know, in, in existing areas, economic development. And I think we'll have a particular focus there on new resources for industrial land planning, whether it's uh, expansion area or an existing area. So just to put that on you and your staff's radar screens, uh, those cycles are starting up now. The the new areas uh, funding in particular, looking at the 2024 20, uh, urban growth cycle. Cool. 
If there's no other questions, I saw Pete raise his hand and threw it back down. So I'm going to take that opportunity to focus on Pete for impact agenda. Oh, Garrett had something. Well, I just, yeah. Am I on mute here? Let's see. Yeah, you're talking. You're, you're coming through. Coming through. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I, you know, the staff has done a pretty good due diligence on this. This is a new process for Metro. It's allowed in the state, but um, the willing, we, apparently a lot of the testimony people wanted to get out of it. So I think uh, I've, I'm supportive of uh, Tiger's development of lands that are ready for development. Um, and we're also working on other developments in that area, as you know, Kingston Terrace is, is in the process of being developed. So I think this is a, a good process. It's been very clear and very grassroots oriented. Cool. Thanks. Well, I'm going to swing over to MPAC. Thanks, guys. Um, Pete, do you have anything for MPAC? Oh, you have the MPAC work program. Um, and the next meeting is the 26th, a week from Wednesday. They still haven't published an agenda or a packet for that. Um, but it's, it's 10 days away, but the... Uh, items that are listed are what you see, uh, the UGB expansion uh, and uh, the recommendation that we uh, we just talked about uh, being probably part and parcel of that particular uh, situation. Also high capacity transit strategies uh, and uh, surprise, surprise, the TriMet forward together. Uh, proposal again will come before uh, impact. So those are uh, the issues that uh, look to be on the agenda. Um, other things in the parking lot for future discussion, employment and industrial lands, placemaking grants, um, talked about Tigard, uh, transfer stations, uh, garbage is always picking up and the parks bond progress report and we um, will be continuing to look at that I think uh, the rest of it is pretty self-explanatory so that's Wednesday October 26th and someday someday I hope Garrett and you can pass this word on Council Rosenthal, that we can get back to in-person because a Zoom conference with MPAC, uh, we have seen how well it works and the answer is not really. So um, thank you. I, I will pass that on. Um, I too prefer the in-person meetings. Uh, you know, the Metro Council is now meeting in person on the council days, not on the work session days. But uh, impact would be a good idea. Thank you. A hell of an idea. Uh, JPEG, Steve, Nafisa, <clears throat> Steve. I'll I'll jump in and then uh, Nafisa, if there's anything you'd care to add, uh, feel free. Um, so we have, um, you know, just a kind of a housekeeping update with MTIP. Um, surprise, surprise, surprise. Uh, we have the same TriMet forward together. So by the time I hear it here and JPAC and at MPAC, I might be able to answer my own questions. Um, <laughs> let's see, we'll have, uh, you know, kind of the update on the joint JPAC Metro Council, um, you know, work that we're doing. Uh, this last one was safe and healthy urban arterials. And then lastly, uh, metros and ODOTs, regional policy mobility update. Um, one other thing that I do want to mention, I think most folks are aware of the um, of the, the sad news of the passing of Frank Angelo. He, um, you know, was on WEA board for years. Uh, and I believe uh, a number of years ago worked for Washington County. And so um, uh, it just seems appropriate to acknowledge his uh, sudden, sudden and, and very unexpected passing and uh, certainly a loss to all of those who knew him as a friend, but also those of us who relied on his expertise and uh, knowledge. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Commissioner Fye, as well as um, 
to Councilor Rosenthal if there's anything else they want to add about JPAC. Okay, you covered it very well, Mayor Calloway. Okay, um, the one thing I saw in there was the draft of the new regional mobility standards. I don't know if we want to take maybe a minute to talk about that. That's going to replace the standard level of service for intersection measures. Um, I don't know if you guys have dug into that. Chris, do you, did you have something or maybe Mike hey, had something? I can just tell you that um, it's been uh, the, the proposal to replace our levels of service standard as um, a key measure, transportation measure with um, but in both the Oregon Highway Plan and the Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, the effort to move to more of a complete streets approach or a complete systems approach, I should say, has been going for a couple of years. I would say it's one of the more complex uh, policy things I've seen come out of <laughs> this regional transportation plan. And uh, what uh, you're going to see at JPAC is what we saw at TPAC last a few weeks ago, um, which is the, the key measures to move forward for both throughways and local streets and the system, the transportation system as a whole, along with a uh, implementation plan. I think every one thing everyone realizes is this is such a significant change that the um, that it may that the vote may be more like, is this the right direction and with some and these are the right measures with direction on what more needs to be studied before it can be operationalized. Or what could how what more do we need to do before we can implement it? So there will be continued discussions, I believe, this week, um, or again at TPAC, I guess it is. Um, and then this will be in front of JPAC for action in December, or yeah, November, December. So yeah, it's uh, and Mike, if Mike's here, he can add anything, but I just want to say that that. Um, it's a it's a it's a challenging one. It's an important one, and it, it it's going to affect uh, everyone's transportation system plans and how they approach plan amendments, and and uh, moving forward. If that made any sense, wait till you see it. <laughs> it's, well, it's deep. I think the distillation of it is it's a it's a pretty massive change in the way we look at intersections, right? For either the the highways or or arterials, right? So I think it's there. It's it's got a lot of moving parts to it. So yep. if folks have questions or comments. I mean, we've to make this big a change. Maybe we need to talk through some more of the models to make us understand what's what it really means. Yeah. I, so I I, I, I know I that think, I know the staff are doing that. <laughs> right. I, I'm not saying I don't think we need to talk about like put you know stopping that. This is terrible. No, I don't think no it's no one no. Of those. No, but I think yeah. it's one of those where we may need more time, right? Mm -hmm. We may need more an ability to digest this uh, massive yeah. change. And, yeah, it, and I think that's part of the proposal is to develop an implementation plan to better work through the parts that need to be worked through. So yeah, so you'll learn more about that at JPAC. Yep. Um, anything from our Region 1 Act folks? Anything they need to share with us? Well, we're not fat on time, but we do have a few more minutes. Um, Frank, anything you'd want to share on the regional um, toll advisory committee? We got that coming up uh, like in a week. Uh, yes, but uh, I haven't seen anything yet because I think they're still reformulating, if you will, <laughs> the uh, concept of the committee. Um, we've got a couple of pieces of material, but I haven't seen an agenda yet. But I've been gone for three weeks, so I'm catching up. But have not seen anything on the agenda yet for this next meeting. Uh, just know where it is, and just to be there. Frank, I don't, I don't think they've, I don't think they've sent an agenda out. I've been monitoring. Yeah. Pete, did you have something? Yeah, um, I'm obviously, as you well know, not seeking re-election, so there will be a new mayor in Forest Grove. Uh, and as a result, my position as representing the other cities in Washington County on the impact uh, on impact will come to an end. So perhaps the largest city in Washington County, uh, Mr. Callaway, ought to start thinking about posting information and 
um, applicants for that particular position. And that would come from the cities of Cornelius, Durham, Sherwood, Tualatin, and Tigard, Wilsonville, and Forest Grove, uh, I believe, uh, being the other cities in Washington County uh, that are part of um, Metro. So, uh, do, you, do you cover us through Thanksgiving? Is that kind of the end of your term? Because don't you? So, get yeah, I was going to say that I probably might get to the November meeting, but uh, if it's after Thanksgiving, the last Monday in in uh, November, the Monday after Thanksgiving, will probably be the Monday night that they swear in the new council in Forest Grove. We don't do the lame duckery through uh, December into January. So as okay. soon as it's certified, they'll put the wheels in motion. Cool. Garrett, you had something? I just wanted a quick update on the uh, the T the whole project, the TV highway project, that both the technical committee and the steering committee are meeting on that, and the equity committee has been gotten is pretty involved. Uh, they've started to identify the different treatments at different stops. In other words, there's a there's a desired corridor width, you know, and configuration, and then there's sort of a minimum configuration width and starting to identify which stops there are. One of the key features is going to be to identify if there, if there are any stops that will, that should be eliminated or consolidated. That's probably one of the next steps that's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, and that's going to be reviewed by the equity committee, of course, because the people have strong opinions about where they want to get on their bus. Yeah, that was a very interesting meeting. Yeah. Mayor Calloway? With all due respect, I would love to have a few minute break in between our two o'clock meeting with the county chair. So I'm gonna, it, maybe we can just stop it and <coughs> say have a great week. Uh, I will end us with the uh, reminder, we've got a meeting a week from today for our next um, workshop. And I gotta throw my hands in the air and uh, we have a new city manager starting today. Welcome, Welcome to Peter. Peter. So see you guys at the next one in uh, two and a half minutes. Thank you, everyone. Bye.